And I think, uh, same time, I think I'm going to send out a chapter five exam. Um, it'll, it'll, it'll be more definition y than anything. Uh, this could be to really do, uh, the, the cases on this are really big. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, so I'll send out a, um, I, I mean, I, I may have a couple cases in there. I mean, I'll, I'll throw some extra credit in there too. Yeah, it should be out by tonight. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say by, by Friday, but ho hopefully by tonight I'll have it out. And it will be due on. What the heck? What am I? What is that? I, my, my thing's got a little goofy. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. We'll say do on um, uh, what was a week plus a day. I'll say do Friday the thirtieth. And then we're going to start on uh, module B. And that handout hopefully will be a little bit better. I'm, I'm, I'm trying something different on that handout. Hopefully it'll make things uh, better. So, okay, let me save that. All right, so let's go to the uh, chapter five handout. And I think, I think we're on number five. I think it's it looks like it was from a while ago. I spelled correctly wrong. Um, I think that's where we're at, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so testing uh, controls relating to relevant assertions. I think that's where we're at. Uh, so this is uh, chapter five, page. Well, the, the page numbers might be different on yours and mine because I think I wrote a bunch of stuff in mine. So, but number five, testing controls relating to relevant assertions. And that is kind of the idea that we, we do the, um, So we do the testing to relevant assertions for test controls, just like we do it for uh, substantive testing for dollar amounts. And in like that, the, and the same thing like the testing for the uh, dollar amounts, while it looks fairly intimidating, all this stuff, uh, actually, you know, if you were to look at what they actually have, so segregation of duties, which we talked about, uh, Pre-numbered documents, okay. Uh, daily reconciliation, okay. You go down here, you'll see, okay, it's the same thing. So while you know it might, might look fairly intimidating, a lot of them are duplicate. You know, they, they you're testing for the same thing. Uh, so anyway, I'm not going to go too far into these. This would be if you were actually doing the testing on them, you'd be looking at these things. You know, are the duties segregated? For instance, let's say um, purchase orders. Uh, are they pre-numbered uh, purchase orders? Virtually every company's going to say yes to that, and you know they, they'll actually account for all the purchase orders, so there's none missing. So that it's um, you can see that all of them are uh, have occurred, and that uh, the completeness the same thing. Count all the you know there's any missing um, numbers. What happened to them? Most of stuff's on computers nowadays. But anyway, so these are the same things that we would, you, the same things you'd test for for dollar amounts, you test for for internal control testing. Uh, they relate to the, the financial statements. Okay, 
uh, the effect of energy size on internal control. Large companies do have better internal controls. They have more reason to control it. If you're running a, let's say you're running a restaurant, if you have one restaurant and you're the owner, you're in there every day, it's probably, you know, you, you, you probably are pretty much aware of what's going on. You know, take that same scenario, suppose you have 50 restaurants, much more difficult to know what's going on. So you'll have better internal controls. Not only that, a lot of times small companies really don't have internal controls. For example, the, the segregation of duties. You remember the segregation of duties? That by car. So these are duties that be segregated. Well, you'll notice something here. If we have an office that only has two people in it, that's impossible. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're not gonna be able to segregate the duties if there's only two people, because there's three, and you know, for any good thing, there's three duties. So uh, for that reason, small companies have worse internal control. Some of them basically don't have any um, internal controls. And you say, okay, well, what do you do with that? You know, what do you do if they don't, they don't have any internal controls? Usually, or hopefully I should say, that there is an owner, an interested owner. The owners. What we mean by that is that, uh, that there'll be somebody there that will want to make sure everything's getting done and done correctly and all that. And then if, if there is a company that has uh, interested owners, the owners are going to look out for their own self-interest. And then you can just focus on the owners. You know, if the owner, if the owners are keeping, you know, the employees in check and all that kind of stuff, then you can focus most of your attention on the owners and the owners' accounts and all that kind of stuff, the bank accounts and uh, how the cash travels around and that for the owners, rather than looking at you know, many employees that, you know, even though there might be a lot of people working there, people working in the office, maybe very few. Um, you know, so if there's a, if they have interested owners, that's a good thing. Um, and if they don't, uh, then you're in, uh, then you have to do a lot of testing, a lot of subsequent testing. Is there something? Okay. The apparent limitations of internal control. Come in four flavors, really three, but they've broken them out into four numbers. Um, the first one is Man. 
management override. Management mm -hmm. overrides the existing internal controls. And this is a, whenever you run into a company that has uh, authenticated fraud, this is part of it. So, come into the accounting department, they'll say, I need to make a journal entry for uh, you know, $3 million in sales. Can't do that. Well, do it or clean out your desk. Management override, You're overriding the uh, controls that are built into the system. And, and here's the thing about limitations of internal control. This is one that people don't like to hear. There's nothing you can do uh, about that to eliminate these. You might do some things to try to stop it, obviously, but it can never be eliminated. It's a limitation of the internal control. There's nothing you can do if you have a management or manager that comes and uh, overrides the controls. You know, whenever, they, whenever a fraud happens, people start stopping around saying, well, how can we make sure this never happens again? You can't. <laughs> uh, these are limitations. Though. Okay. B. Spell that right. This is, uh, so collusion of employees. Um, that's when they get together to foil the segregation of duties. So collusion of employees. This is when. Um, let's say two or more. Uh, collude to collude employees, two employees uh, collude to avoid the segregation of duties or override controls, um, you know, by themselves. So. You get somebody from, uh, let's say, let's say you have somebody in the Treasury Department. They handle the cash, that's the uh, asset. And you have someone in accounting, that's the record keeping. Yeah, if those two people get together. You know, one person steals the cash, the other person covers for it. Uh, that they've just, just, you know, they, you know, the duties were segregated. You know, they've been segregated perfectly. But if two people get together, they can foil those controls. So that's a collusion work, and that is a limitation. You say, how can you stop that? Get rid of all the humans. I mean, how, you know, how do you? There's no way to stop it. Uh, you, you can do things to try. Uh, I mean, you can't limit it. There are things you can try to do to avoid it. I, I think I may have told you guys that when I worked at uh, U.S. Steel, you know, usually all the corporate employees are kind of in the same area. They'll be in the same office. They'll be at headquarters, and that's where everybody meets, right? Um, we actually had our treasury people in a little office you know, 10 miles from the plant. And it, it, part of it is that segregation. You, know, you don't want people getting together who have custody of the asset of cash and you know, the other people, you know, they, 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 they physically kept us 10 miles apart. Uh, and that's one of the things about it. You know, they, they're trying to avoid people getting together. Okay, uh, the next two used to be one.
Six years of controls by employees. And I don't pay to they tell you never come in told you about this. That thing is about me working in a bicycle shop when I was like 14. I can't really tell you this or not. You probably do. But, um, but anyway, uh, when I was 14, they started working in a bicycle shop. Back then, I don't know if you can work in a bicycle shop when I was 14. But anyway, I was working in a bicycle I didn't have a social security number. That's another weird thing. I didn't have a social security number. And when I did get one, it said that I was born in New York. Which I was. But anyway, um, uh, so I learned in, in a bicycle shop when I was 14, and they hired three kids. We were, I, you know, we were all four, I think two of us were 14 when we I can't remember. Anyway, the bicycle shop. And all the people that worked on the bicycles, you know, they would build a bicycle. And we were working the cash register so that these people could work on the bicycle bills. You know, put the kid, which you can tell is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> but anyway, so th these registers were old. And so we'd ring up something and you'd hand them the tape. And people say, well, I can't read this. And so you go over and you ring it up on another register. Bring it up in that one, the old register. Oh, I can't read that one either. I'll get you over to the third one and bring it up again. We didn't realize that there's supposed to be, uh, you know, whatever's rung up on the register should be in the drawer. Uh, we had no idea that that was a control. And so, you know, we all got called in like, you know, a couple of weeks out. You know, somebody's stealing tons of money from him. We had all these sales, and, then, and one of the managers finally was looking at us and said, Wait a minute, why are these things all being rung up you know, 30 seconds apart? On different registers. Oh, because that, that one doesn't have. Anyway, mistakes. 14 year old kids running cash registers have no idea what a cash register is. Um, you know, that, uh, and, and, and here's the thing during that period of time, somebody could have been taking money because that control was not effective because we didn't know what we were doing. So, mistakes by employees uh, is a Thing. Now, you can try to uh, mitigate that by, first of all, telling employees, you know, about the controls, um, uh, but you can't eliminate it completely, and it, it happens. I, I think J.P. Morgan just had, uh, they, they uh, accidentally paid out billions in, uh, to, for bonds they shouldn't have, uh, because and, and we're, you know, we're talking about People high up in the company doing transfers of billions of dollars, and they made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it does uh, it does happen. And the third one, uh, fourth one, I should say, this used to be included in the second one, but this one they kind of broke out separately, and that is. Oops. Okay, uh, here's some programming software. They kind of break that out as a separate one. And then, uh, that errors in, in the software itself uh, is something that you cannot eliminate. You try to, but it's going to happen. And, and it could be errors in programming, it could be errors in uh, um, compatibility and all kinds of stuff. That used to be with C, maybe. So these two used to be together. Now they have them separately, which isn't that big a deal. But anyway, so these are limitations. And here's the thing you cannot eliminate them. You, you try, you try to mitigate them, you try to make them less likely, but you cannot, you know, prevent them 100%. So, okay, question, I think. Okay, communication of internal controls. Uh, internal control uh, deficiencies. These are these are internal control weaknesses. So you come you come across an internal control weakness. For instance, um, let's say that the uh, well, let's say that the, the purchase order um, system it doesn't require a password. You know, it's a problem because somebody be ordering stuff they shouldn't be ordering. They're not authorized to. 
All right, so what, what do you do with that? So all significant efficiencies. Efficiencies are weaknesses. And material Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. So significant internal control deficiencies and material internal control deficiencies must be reported to management and the board of directors, our audit committee for both of those. So you have to tell management about them. But you also have to tell the board of directors and the audit committee. Okay, so I know these are kind of vague terms, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, significant is a term that is less than material. So it does not have to be a material deficiency to give reported to the board of directors. It can be a significant one, which is less. And here's another thing. This is kind of definition. But by definition, a material weakness is significant. And I, and I say that because if you read something that says a significant internal control deficiency, something about that, that, that also relates to material internal control deficiencies. And sometimes you'll see it listed in that. They'll just talk about a significant internal control deficiency. A material internal control deficiency is a significant one. It's a higher level. And I know those are kind of vague terms, but that's kind of what we have. So those must be reported to um, management of the board of committee within 60 days. Uh, audit report date. So everything must be reported within 60 days of the audit report date. You can tell them about that stuff earlier, and you probably will. So you come across uh, you know, a problem. OK, you don't have a password on the purchasing system. So you know, you'll know, you tell them about that. Look, you got to get a password on. You know, you, you'll probably tell them about that sooner. But um, you, it will be officially done, uh, no, it, it must be in writing. Okay, so you come across material weakness, there are significant weaknesses in internal control. You for the management and board of directors. If it's insignificant,
So if there were insignificant, so uh, insignificant control deficiencies are are only reported to management. So the thing, you know, you don't want to bother the board of directors with something that's insignificant. Uh, the board of directors will be told that, look, we gave mm -hmm. insignificant deficiencies to upper management, mm -hmm. but you don't go into detail with them about it. You know, this one you go into detail to significant and material or, and or material. Um, you'll you go into detail. It'd be easy to say, okay, and if you want to follow, if they want to follow up and see what those are with management, that's up to the board of directors. But uh, you're not going to report um, the individual insignificant deficiencies to them. A couple of reasons. First of all, you don't want to bother them with something that's insignificant. And second of all, um, you don't want to put stuff in there that might that they might confuse as being significant, right? So, so for instance, uh, you know, if there's something. Um, Whatever, uh, people are not bringing back the um, cash receipts when they you know, they use petty cash to buy something. So you use petty cash to buy postage stamps or whatever. They don't bring back the receipt. Petty cash is petty. You, you, you know, it's insignificant. Uh, by definition, it's insignificant. You don't want to give that to the board of directors and have them think it's a big deal. You know, oh, what's this? <laughs> it's nothing. That's what that is. You know, so. Um, you know, you give that to management. You come across you give it to management, but you are not going to bother the board of directors with that. And you don't want them, you, you don't want to report it because they might take it seriously when it really isn't. It really has nothing to do with the financial statement. Okay. Wow. Oh. So the Uh, substantive testing. Uh, okay. So this is testing for dollars. And it's only for testing dollar amounts. You know, we don't care whether it was authorized correctly or not. I mean, we don't care if we had attitudes. But uh, when you're looking, you're just looking at to see if they're, uh, you know, the, if, if the financial statements are not materially, uh, free of material misstatements, fairly free. So you're only looking at the dollar amounts, not what the financial goes. Okay, timing. When you do this testing, it depends on what it is. So some things that we need to do, worry about the timing of inventory. Uh, that usually involves sales, cutoffs, purchase cutoff. Uh, you almost we have something for uh, cash deposits. Uh, at the end of the year, you know, especially those things that are at year end. Uh, you know, if you're looking at these things as of, uh, so if I, well, then, you know, these things are important to be on hand and that, you know, to be there when, when these things are happening. So a lot of times you get a sales cut off to see what was the last thing shipped on that date. Purchase cut off, what was the last thing you received on that date on 1231? Uh, what cash deposits went in on 1231? Those are, excuse me, I just bored myself. Uh, those are things that you will, um, you know, kind of want to be there uh, at the end of year end for. Now, there are some things you might be testing ahead of time. 
And it's only if the control if the internal controls are good. So let's take inventory. So inventory can be tested at interim dates if the internal controls are, are um, effective. So for example, you could test for um, You know, you don't have to wait to the end of the year to actually be testing on inventory that we received and uh, sold and all that. You can, you know, for instance, January through October, there's no reason why you couldn't do that ahead of time. You, you could do this in November. That would be an interim date. When we're talking about the interim dates, it means between the audits. So there are some, and there are some things you can do that way. Uh, but it's only if the internal controls are effective. You know, the internal controls have to be effective or else you can't do it. Okay. And by the way, I have down here interim testing. That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to take that out because it's talking about it. Detection risk. Okay. Detection risk is. Detection risk is a risk that auditors will fail to detect a material misstatement on the financial statements. So this is the auditors will fail. So the detection risk is a risk that the auditors will fail. Now low detection risk, right? And, you know, low detection risk is usually for companies, usually for clients that are um, riskier. So let's say so let's say you got it to the 99 percent level. So the detection risk is say one percent. Then we change that. Oh, for example, if they're in bankruptcy. So low detection if is at full or clients that are riskier. So low detection risk is for clients that are riskier. So you're going to do, um, so what does this mean? This means more testing. Yeah. 
So low detection risk means you do more testing. Why? Because they're riskier. You know, if they have a if they have a reason, a better reason to say cook the books, um, you say, okay, well, I got to do more testing because we are not. Th th there's more of an incentive for a company that's going bankrupt, say, to cook the books than a company that's doing very well. Companies that's doing very well. Say, hey, you know, take a look. High detection risk is for companies that are safer. Um, let's see 10%. Yeah. Okay, that's both four. Okay. So come they're less whiskey. So they're let's say they're uh, profitable. So companies that are profitable, they have less incentive to cook the books. So you can probably get fairly, uh, you know, you can probably get very comfortable uh, using a lower standard for them. You need not, you won't completely trust them, obviously, but uh, you'll be less tested. So you'll have a higher detection risk to be allowed. Any questions on that? So low detection risk is usually when you're um, unsure of something. And a high detection risk is when you have a company that is, you, you don't, you don't um, they're less risky. You don't anticipate any problems with them. Now you might say, well, why don't we just test all companies to the low detection? You know, you have good, bad, or whatever. Why don't we just all do all the 1%? The reason you don't do that is you're spending the client's money. And quite honestly, if a company's doing very well, and you'd be just, you know, if you're comfortable at 10%, uh, with the less testing, less cost, uh, you should probably go with that. Yeah. There is this idea, too, that, you know, you're, it is really your client's money that you're spending uh, to some extent. So, um, you know, generally this is kind of the way it goes. Uh, low detection risk is for companies that are riskier. High detection risk for companies that are uh, less risky or safer. Okay, question on that thing? Oh, boy. Okay. I know there's a lot of definitional kind of stuff. Stuff I hate. All right. This is something that is fairly new and it's a big thing nowadays. And it's on the CPA exam. They're testing this on the CPA exam. Um, they're called SOC reports. And SOC reports are come in a few different flavors, SOC 1, SOC 2, and SOC 4. I'm just kidding, SOC 3. So SOC 1, SOC 2, and SOC 3. So these are reports. Now, these are reports are actually trademarked by the AICPA. The AICPA makes the CPA exam. That is <laughs> a good reason why these are probably going to end up on there. And they, they actually said that they're going to test, especially SOC 1 and SOC 2, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, these are actually audits. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This is my handout's so boring. It must stay catchy. Um, so examples, so this is right, these are for service organizations. So these are companies that offer services. This is not for companies that are selling products usually, it's a service. And the individual business. So examples of service. So maybe you have someone that does your payroll. ADP is a company that does payroll, large company that does payroll. That would be a service. Instead of, um, well, let's take a look at 
uh, instead of a Roosevelt pain in play, they might go to ADP. And ADP will say, okay, you give us the information and we'll, we'll make the payment. You tell us what to pay and we'll pay them. So it's a service that's done by um, a, a different organization. Uh, electronic commerce. Uh, Amazon, you may have heard of a company that sells stuff on Amazon. There's a lot of big companies that sell stuff on Amazon. Some little companies, uh, Walmart, same thing. They have some fairly big companies that sell on their site. Um, those are services. They're not actually, you know, if you're on Amazon, Amazon isn't necessarily taking possession of your product, uh, but they're arranging for the sale. That's a, that's a service. And internet services, say AT&T, Comcast, Microsoft. There's, there's a lot of other stuff. There's cloud services and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So now you say, well, okay, who cares about these things, right? So you know, services, big, big deal. Well, here's the problem you have. Um, the problem you have is that, let's take the payroll. Is someone auditing Roosevelt University, if they use ADP for their payroll, just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean you're off the hook for payroll. You have to know whether those controls over payroll are appropriate, so on and so forth. So, you know, just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean that you do not have to get um, some kind of insurances about the internal controls of those. So that's a problem. You know, let's say that there's 5,000 companies that have ADP do their payroll. You can't have 5,000 sets of auditors walking through ADP checking on their internal controls. Now they have to get they have to get uh, you know some assurance on the internal controls for their audit because payroll is probably a big number. Um, but ADP cannot have uh, you know thousands of auditors walking through the place. So what do they do? That's where these SOC reports come in. So these SOC reports are one auditor, you know, on a firm will get the audit, they will go in and do tests of the controls and so forth and write a report. And you as you know, auditing say Roosevelt will use that report to say, okay, this report you know, shows the controls that they have and they seem to be appropriate. So the SOC reports are for service organizations that uh, provide services for somebody, but they're there so that they can complete their audits and other things too, but that they can complete their audit and, and get some understanding of the internal controls that are in place. So it's there because we cannot have thousands of auditors walking through ADP or any other place. Uh, you know, any other, you can't have thousands of auditors walking through Microsoft to see what their controls are. So Microsoft will issue a SOC 1, SOC 2, or SOC 3. OK, so let's see what these are. What's all in SOC 1, SOC 2, and SOC 3. SOC 1 is the one that we're most, uh, this is the one that we will, you would most likely use for uh, auditing. It's for financial reporting only. So they say, here's the financial controls over the amount, you know, amounts that they have, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is what the external auditors would be. So the external auditor. Eh. In other words, the CPAs. They will get this SOC 1 report. And again, it's only over the controls of the financial statements. So that's the one that's probably the most appropriate for, uh, and that's the one that they would be using. So this one is the one that, and, and, and up, I, now they say they're going to start testing the SOC 2. 
But up until now, only the SAC one was really tested on the CPA. Unit. Okay. Oh, I already did this here. See, uh, Annie, right. Some man with me. Okay, well, uh, so SAC one used for the external auditors to get enough appropriate evidence. So sorry. Okay, type one. And, and you'll, you'll find this with all of these. All three of these will have type one or type two. Type one is that they look at the design of the internal controls. And type two is that the internal controls are the design is looked at, but they're also they also check the operational um, effectiveness of the internal controls. In other words, they do testing. So type one, no testing, type two, testing. And you can imagine type two is the better of those two. Type one is, I imagine, for smaller businesses or something like that. But type two is the one that's gonna be the expensive one. And that one is probably, you know, I would imagine the ADP would have a type two. That they would actually do testing to see if the controls are effective. Okay, so SAC one is for uh, financial reporting, that's the one. So auditors are number one. So we do the SOC one report. Uh, SOC two report is actually a more detailed report. And it goes into everything, you know, security, service outage, uh, privacy, things that are not related to the financial reporting. The financial reporting will be in there. But they'll also have these other things in there. And um, this report is not given to the general public. It's a very detailed report. Most people in the general public wouldn't know how to read it. Uh, it's restricted use. It's used for companies that are trying to decide which service organization to go with, that they will have their um, IT people will look into these things and, and, really, and see if they are, you know, if what they have is adequate and all that kind of stuff. So this is usually made for, by people and companies that are for determining who they're going to get for their, um, for their, you know, to provide them with the services. SOC 1 and SOC 2, these two, are restricted. SOC 3 is for the public. So SOC 3 is for the public. So that's the last one. Oops, SOC 2, SOC 3. So SOC 3 is for the public. SOC 3 is, uh, it's, it's, it's not that it's, it, it, it's, it, it's in general terms that everyone can read. So it is, say dumbing down, but it's it, it made more accessible. So that people can, that normal people that aren't familiar with internal controls can read it. And you know, so someone might say, well, you know, I know ADP is doing my payroll, but what kind of controls do they have? This is the report you handle, the SOC 3. Um, anyone can read it. It's usually, it's much less detailed. And it's, it, it will speak in more general terms, but it will also speak in terms that are, um, you know, uh, less technical and more readable. Is a better way to put it. And again, this is for the general public, and it's it's made that way um, purposefully so that you have something to hand somebody uh, when they ask about the internal controls. So, an employee comes up and says, "What are the controls on my payroll?" That you say. I just hear you. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one for now. Let's see. Oh, Paso. <laughs> I can't skip this one. All right. Uh, I, so I'm going to skip number 11. Yeah, you can read through it. It's not that. It's not difficult. I don't think you have a difficult time doing it, but we're getting down to it. We got to finish this thing. 
Okay, this is the new uh, Think for internal controls. And so here's 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 what this is. This is called uh, commonly called CASO, C O S O, or CASO E R N, C O S O E R N. Um, what it what it came down to is there's a number of organizations that were defining internal control. You have the ACPA internal control, you have the internal auditors defining internal control. And all these people that were defining internal control, and it was all different. It was all a little bit different. So you have multiple organizations that were all looking at internal control, which is the same thing for all of them. But it wasn't, you know, they, 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 were, they were not the same. And so the... Um, it was decided that these people should all get together and figure out what internal control really should be. A, a comprehensive internal control that everyone can use. So this Costco thing can be used for a number of organizations, not just uh, auditors and not just uh, you know, internal auditors or, in, or computer programming or whatever that, it would be a comprehensive kind of uh, thing for everyone to use and for um, internal control. So having said that, as you can imagine, when you get a lot of different groups together, that makes for a very big document, right? You know, they all have their things that they think are important, and they probably are, but you know, it's they have five, they have, you know, so you get the, so this actually has become kind of a complex thing. This is tested on the CPA exam and they're testing it more heavily all the time. And it's, it's getting very, uh, to be a very significant portion of the CPA exam. Um, it's, it hasn't completely taken over all the internal control stuff on it, but a lot of it. Okay. So a committee of sponsoring organization, that's where the castle comes in. Of the Treadway Commission, they leave that part out. Um, and it's got its on uh, framework and on uh, enterprise risk management, which is another kind of key term. That's kind of a, um, a computery uh, kind of term, but they also use it for just regular risk for a company. But ERM is enterprise risk management. So you'll sometimes see, see this called this. So I see it called Castle-ERM. And that's Castle. So we have a sponsoring organization, um, enterprise risk management. And here's the different groups that they had that are all in there. But this is used by many groups outside of even this. Okay, so these are the five components of it. And these components are really what you need to step to focus on are these five components of the castle. I'm going to show you, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, go down to the cube. There's our cube. Uh, I guess we have a cube here. Okay, so this is this is the very last thing in the handout. I put this at the beginning of the handout. You guys probably would have dropped it, but um, so these are this is <laughs> this is the Casso cube. Hello, Casso Cube. So this is, um, you, you see the five different areas. That's not so bad. But then you see all this other stuff around here. Okay, uh, what this really relates to is, if you think about it in auditing terms, are the different types of audits. There's the operational audit. Operational audit for effectiveness and efficiency, okay? Uh, reporting audit, that's what we do, financial reporting financial audits. Compliance audits, that'd be like an IRS audit. 
Right. So you're going to have controls over, you know, the operate for operational auditing for financial reporting and you know, auditing and for compliance auditing, you know, for the taxes and government grants and all that kind of stuff. So to say that there's, you know, these, these all relate to these three different types of audits. Now, the really irritating one is this, <laughs> uh, you know, entry level, that's the entity level division operating function. So entity level is the highest level. So there are controls that will relate, you know, any of these controls that are relate to the entity level, the entire company, down to the division level, down to the operating level, and down to the actual people working on the floor of the place, whatever it is. Um, you know, in other words, these controls go all through all the levels. You know, they kind of break it out here to the different levels. But it really is these five items and say, okay, these relate to the types of audits that we're going to do. And they relate to all the levels of the organization. So, you know, the upper level, you know, they, they still have the response, I mean, some responsibilities and control environment, all that kind of stuff. All right, so this cube is commonly it's in everything. You can see it in everything. So the cube is basically the five items, and then the saying they relate to these other things at all levels. And you know, so here's like here, here's a breakdown of the levels. You know, at the energy level, you have General Motors versus the company General Motors. So there are controls that relate to a very high you know, upper level. The entire company kind of thing, General Motors. Going down to the divisions. Now, General Motors makes, you know, they do a bunch of stuff. Well, they make autos. They, I'm sure they have a financing arm. They used to do uh, trains and stuff. I don't know if they do that anymore. But anyway, you know, one of their divisions would be the auto division. Okay. And they make automobiles. Okay. Well, operating unit, maybe Buick. Buick is one of the uh, an operating unit of General Motors. And then now the function level, you know, auto assembly plant in Wisconsin. That's the functional level of the people actually making the cars and so forth. And so these controls will um, affect all of them. Okay, and this is going to explain what this is explain about the auditing, the operational audits, financial audits, compliance audits. So those are the three types of audits. These are just the levels of organization. And they're just saying these five things relate to those. Kind of common sense. So when you do this, you're just gonna kind of look at these five items. Oops, these five items. You know, these are what you're going to focus on for the CPA exam. Uh, these five items, okay, yeah, they, they relate to these other things. Um, but you know, they, stay there, they go throughout the company. Okay. Uh, control environment. Uh, we're not going to go through all these, but they're, they're, some of these are um, Organization demonstrates commitment to integrity and ethical, ethical values. This is huge in the AICPA. Integrity and ethical values. Um, those are key words that you always look for in management. And this one is also commonly seen. Um, a big thing that they talk about in auditing is top down. Uh, or sometimes called one at the top. And what this means is whenever the top people in the company think about internal controls it is going to go down through the company. People at the top don't care, no one else in the company is going to care either. Okay, so that's what I want to hate top down. Also, you know, the, 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 the tone at the top that those are the people that are going to set the, you know, how the company is going to react. And, and, um, 
and then that's what they look for. They look for you know managers that have they have integrity and they have ethical values and all that kind of stuff. But the, this one at the top is big. So this is you'll see this come up time and time again. Of, you know what's the most important thing? Uh, you're looking at a company tone at the top. Okay, risk assessment. Um, so risk assessment is that the companies actually look at the risks. You know, what, what are the risks of our company? So company will look at their risks and they will specify what their objectives are for those risks. And they could be anything. Could the, the risk could be uh, financial, the risk could be operational, it could be whatever. And so they look at specific risks. Uh, it could be for, you know, one thing for hackers and things like that. Uh, those are specific risks that they are looking for um, that, you know, identifying them. Once they identify them and you know, make those uh, specific, you know, we want to stop this from happening or ensure that this happens, then they start doing the control activities. So this one, they assess the risk. Down here, they actually create the controls. Okay, you know. We want to stop hackers from getting into our thing. We're going to have software that has a uh, um, blank here, fire firewall, uh, you know, that uh, prevents things from getting through. So, you know, the idea is that you're going to create the control. So you look at the risks, create the controls. Those controls will give data to management. That they can use. You know, we stop this many uh, hacker attacks and whatever, you know. So there'll be some kind of communication that will be sent back from these controls that will give information to management and they can uh, react appropriately. So it, it could be any number of, of things that they get back. But so the big ones here are look at the risks, see specifically what they are, design controls to either prevent something from happening or ensure that it does happen. And then down here is that the you'll actually get feedback on what those controls are doing. How many you know how many of these uh, uh, attacks were made or it could be you know something about you know, um, people overriding systems and you know uh, how you know how many times does that happen how do we prevent it and all that kind of thing so it should be some kind of data that comes back that ensures that these controls are working uh, it could be any uh, it could be any number of forms but in fact now monitoring the controls this is to um, this is for so this is the feedback uh, they give. This is data being feedback, but down here, this is for managing the controls. What we're really talking about here is improving the controls. How do we improve the controls? So it's kind of a, a loop, you know, that they'll say, okay. How are the controls working? So they'll do an evaluation of the controls and see whether they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if they're not, then you go back, you know, see what the risk is, develop different controls or more controls, and you get the data loop. And you know, so the data will often tell whether it's working or not. Um, you know, so. This is kind of the thing. So anyway, long story short, can't do that right now, but <laughs> long story short, these are kind of what you're gonna focus on for the CPA exam. You know, and, and quite honestly, you know, the, the control environment is kind of the tone at the top kind of thing. But the rest of these are kind of the loop, you know. What, what are the risks? Let's design some controls and put them in place. And this is the information on the controls, how the controls are working, you know, that's 
to our data. Down here is okay. We got the controls up. Are they are they actually doing what they're supposed to do? We had uh, you know fifteen people try to hack into the place and two were successful. Okay, but, uh, you know our controls aren't working. We got to go back, maybe identify the risk more narrowly, and then try for more you know, develop controls to stop everyone from being able to hack in and uh, that sort of thing. So anyway, okay, so that is the. Um, Oh, they're internal control. That's a big one. And I am going to, I will send out a, um, I have never, I'll make an exam for this. And I'll send out. And the exam will be, it'll be a little bit more definition. Uh, as I say, I might give you, a, you know, I'll give you at least a, a couple of cases, you know, things in there to take a look at. And I'll probably put an extra credit or two on there. But the, um, it's, it's basically going to be through, the, through this stuff. And I know it's a lot. I mean, it's, it's you know, uh, this is heavily tested on the CPA exam. And so, you know, it, it, well, it took us a long time to get through it. This is actually very important. So. Oh, uh, number nine. Let me take a look at number nine. Uh, number nine, uh, the interim testing. Uh, good, good question. Uh, so the in interim testing was underneath here. I actually talked about it up here. So this is the interim testing, interim dates. So let me, I'll open up something here. So interim testing is, done throughout the year. Oops, I suppose. <laughs> And then they, they could be uh, tests of controls. It could also be tests of uh, substantive tests. Yeah, so that's what interim testing is. So, so for instance, you do testing in uh, March or whatever it is. And, and, and part of the reason why is that uh, And, and, and I, I don't think I actually really explained very well why you do the interim testing. You say, well, why, why do you want to do it? Why, why don't you just wait till year end and then do it? The problem with the year end is that you may have many companies that have a year end at the same time. It's very hard. You really crunch the time of year end. CPA firms, um, this is not an exaggeration, they, you will. Uh, during their busy season, like you know, when, once they're doing all these audits, um, 70, 80 hour weeks are not unusual. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, on, on Sunday, you don't have to come in until 9 o'clock, <laughs> 9 a.m. You know, and we'll leave at 5. Um, you, you, you work around the clock. So, having said that, and, and you know, in, in the summertime, the auditors are twiddling their thumbs because they don't have anything to do. So a lot, if, if you can move some of that testing, and if a company has good internal controls, you know, if you can move some of that testing throughout the year, it really helps the time budget. It helps keep, you know, it keeps people busy on the audit um, and, and doing, you know, performing their work, but doing it ahead of time. And again, if you're, if, let's say your year end is December 31st, there's nothing to stop you from testing from, you know, do the testing for October through January. You can do that if you want. And then you just have the last two months to do the, you know, to do the testing at the end of the year, which is obviously is quicker and so on. So that the whole purpose of interim testing, uh, interim, doing interim procedures 
whether it's testing and controls or um, uh, substance testing, is that you can spread it out. Not have such a big crunch at your, at your end when you're doing five audits. You know, they all have to be done within a few weeks and all that kind of stuff. So that's all that's all for us being interim testing. And, and, and that's why it's if you larger companies, they will definitely use it. Uh, if you, I think I did this before, but if you ever go into like a, so there, there are some, uh, some Walmarts are open 24 hours. If you go into one of those Walmarts at one in the morning, there's going to be more employees in there than there are going to be people, uh, you know, customers. But you'll, a lot of times you'll see aisles that are blacked off. They'll say, you know, blacked off for um, inventory. And they'll actually have tags on all the stuff in the aisle. And they'll go take those tags and they'll count all the stuff on there, write the SKU numbers down. The SKU numbers are um, the, the, the barcodes, basically, you know, that, that kind of thing. So there are people that will come in. And sometimes they're employees of the place. Sometimes they are outside people coming in and do the inventory. And, and, and if you're an auditor, you know, one o'clock in the morning, you'll go and you'll watch them, uh, you know, observe them taking inventory and see, see what their uh, procedures are and all that. Yeah. Uh, and again, in and, and, and larger companies, especially retail places, Walmart, Target, they, they do lose some stuff at year end, but an awful lot of it is done during the year. And so, you know, they actually don't have the one big audit at the end of the year. They will have it throughout the year. Okay. Um, I tell you what, let's, uh, let's take a break. Any, uh, well, let me stop. Is there any other questions? Professor, yes. Before you take the break, can you go back to the page where the interim testing was? I need to couple, write a couple of things down from there. Right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, let's say let's be back at what? Um, let's be back at seven twenty-three. Oops. Anyway. Do here, the thing stuck. Yeah, and then the, the next thing we're going to cover, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to change, I'm trying to make the class more effective. Uh, this next hand, I think. Goes. Okay, I'm done. Okay, well, I'll, I'll leave it. Up. Okay.
Okay. Um, the next thing we're going to cover is kind of a, a weird uh, numbering thing in the book, but it's module B in the book. The book is laid out with chapters, and then it's laid out with modules. And if you go through it, the modules are a little bit more detailed, a little more, um, a little more examples and that sort of thing in there. But it's just so anyway. This is module B. It's sort of like a chapter, but it's um, module B. And what we're going to cover today is <clears throat> we talk about how you have to be independent to do an audit. You need to be unbiased. You have to be independent. And CPA firms they have thousands of people in them. So the question becomes, well. Who has to be independent from this? You know, if you're running IBM, who has to be independent from IBM? Does everybody? You know, if there's a, a shipping supervisor uh, someplace, do they have to be independent? If there's, you know, does the janitor have to be independent? You know, who has to be independent? And so that's kind of what this whole thing is. And it's going to be. It, it's based on. Um, they, they, their term, the term for people that are held to this higher level is that they are covered members. And when they say covered members, it means covered by these, um, these sets of rules. So that's kind of what we're going to work on today is figuring out who's a covered member and what they can and cannot do. Now, um, we're going to do a little bit of the polling for this uh, and I think I was, I think this is what I'm going to start doing in the future is using the polling function in Zoom. But anyway, uh, so pull up that handout if you would. It's, it says for module B. Uh, is there one that did not get it? Okay, it's in, um, it looks like this. Okay, so covered members. <clears throat> so covered members are people that are going to be held to a higher standard in the um, CPA firm. That they are the ones that are going to have to really be completely independent uh, in both fact and in appearance uh, when they do the audit. So the question is, well, who? You know, who is that? Who, you know, who has to be independent? Okay. The first group, which is kind of obvious probably, is the people who are doing the audit. So people on the audit engagement team. Oops. The partner, any manager, uh, seniors, and associates all of those people on the um, audit team have to be independent. They're held to a higher standard of independence, I should say. So that's the first group. The second group are all of the partners in the engagement office. So for instance, if this is the Chicago office. <clears throat> All the partners in that Chicago office have to be independent. Now, if you're a partner in the St. Louis office or Indianapolis office, it doesn't apply to you. But if you're in the Chicago office and they do the audit in the Chicago office, then you are what they call a covered member. And uh, we're gonna hold you to a higher, um, a higher level of independence. Okay. And the last of what I call kind of the main groups are the non-attest people Attestations are a thing like audit, audits are to attestations. 
So the non-attest people, the people who don't do audits, and these are usually consulting people. Um, they are the partners and managers. Although there is a, we call it 10 hour rule, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so these are the people that are held to the higher standard. The other people aren't. So for instance, if you're a senior and you're not on the audit, you're not a covered member. The covered member rules don't apply to you. If you're, if you're a manager uh, you know, or even a partner down here, your partner in this uh, consulting office, the rules don't apply to you. You're not a, a covered member. So it's only those people that are considered covered member that the covered member rules apply to. Okay, now you'll notice the non attest one is only the partners and managers. And then there's this 10 hour rule, which we'll talk about. So these are the, the main people that you think about when you think about covered members. Okay, the non attest people are uh, covered members only if they perform 10 hours or more of services in a year. So some of the times it's called 10 hour people. So you'll see 10 hour people in the, um, when you're reading, you know, for the CPA exam and they'll talk about 10 hour people. And they don't say 10 hour auditors, they usually say 10 hour people because the auditors, you know, if you're on the audit team, it doesn't mean if you work for 10 minutes on the audit team, you're on the audit team. So these are for you, and, and 10 hours is sort of like, um, do they really do any significant work for the, this client? You know, if someone called up about some tax issue and the you know, manager responded you know, and charged them for two hours or something on it, is that, that, that's not what they're talking about. It, it has to be at least 10 hours. So it has to be a somewhat significant amount of work. So 10 hour people. So those are the normal ones. Okay, now, there are a few other ones that uh, come into play who are also covered members. Okay. First one is anyone who can influence the audit. So you may have a senior partner that oversees a few offices. Those are, they're considered someone who can influence the audit. So anyone who's in the, the position of influencing the audit is also a covered member. The CPA firm itself is a covered member. So not only people working at it, but the, the whole firm, you know, if, if you're auditing IBM, your firm cannot have, uh, you know, investments in IBM, for example. So anyone who has influenced the firm itself, and this one is sort of a kind of closing up a loophole. And it's, it's any entity that is controlled by covered members. So this gets away from someone saying, oh, I know, you know, let's get all the partners together. You know, we'll get these three partners together and we will make our own entity, we'll make our own company and that company will buy stock in, uh, IBM and you know none of us has a you know has a controlling interest you know we all have one third interest but uh, you know if the if the total amount of control is over 50 percent it's considered a covered member so if it's a if it's a, any any business that is more than 50 percent owned by covered members is a covered member if it's less than that it's not so if you just had like, you know, one partner that has a 20% interest in something, well, whatever he has 20% in, or she has 30% interest in, it's not, it's not a covered member. OK, 
Okay, so these are the main ones. These are the ones we're going to talk about really the most here. Um, and, and these are the ones you, you get trying to get tested a little bit more on. Okay, who can own what? Direct financial interest. Covered members cannot own any direct financial interest. So direct financial interest versus buying the stock or buying bonds from IBM, you can't do it. If you owning one share of IBM stock means you are not, it means that you are in violation of uh, the independence rules. So you cannot own one shot stock of IBM. You can't own one bond from IBM, nothing. No direct financial interest. Indirect financial interest. So current members may own indirect financial interest if they are immaterial. And next question, logical question would be, well, what's an indirect financial interest? Okay, um, a standard importer's uh, 500 fund, for example. So that owns 500 of the largest companies. So San Ports 500 phone, they, they buy stock of 500 of the biggest companies. And if, uh, let's say that IBM is one of them. Okay, it's indirect because you buy into the fund, the fund then takes the money and buys the stock. So it's indirect. Next question is, is it a material investment? You know, is it material? You know, it is investment itself, um, the amount of IBM stock is it material to the investment? Well, IBM would be one of 500 companies. It's a big company, but at the same time, it's one of 500. So, and these are all big companies. I mean, you know, there's no little, no little, no little ones in there. So, this would be okay. So, Stanford, so if you have money invested in the Standard Poor's 500 fund and it has um, IBM stock in it. It's fine. It's indirect and it's immaterial. Now, if you have a fund that invests heavily in IBM, that very well could be material. 
instead of one of 500, maybe it's one of three companies and it's you know, uh, whatever. Uh, so it could be material. Another way, uh, suppose you invest in a, um, you invest in Bank of America. Oops. And Bank of America So you own, you own stock in Bank of America. Bank of America loans money to IBM. It's indirect. You don't actually own IBM stock or you know, you know, loaning money to IBM directly. Bank of America. Is. So you're it's indirect. And usually uh, it'd be unusual if Bank of America was if IBM was the only company that loaned money to. They probably have thousands, not millions of you know people that are loaning money to. So that's probably definitely, I would say that's definitely material. Um, it would be very unusual to have one company get most of the loans from them. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do next. So here is the part that is different than the other ones that we've been doing, the handouts. I'm gonna start a poll. The polls are not anonymous. They're by your name and <clears throat> No one else will see it. <laughs> I, will, I will see it, but it'll have your name. And so when you answer these, I will be able to download it and know that you completed these. Now, if you weren't in the class, you gotta turn it in by hand. But uh, people that are in the class, you don't need to because this will be in the polls themselves. So we're gonna go through some scenarios, some cases on you know, based on what we've known so far and see whether these are, uh, Violation of the rules. Okay. So again, these are not anonymous. Uh, they are <laughs> unanonymous. But they, they, they have your name, and that's that I can actually I can actually uh, see who uh, did the thing. And, and again, this is I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to make these a little more interactive. I mean, hopefully a little. A little bit better. <laughs> okay, so let's go through these. Gina is a member of the audit engagement uh, team for, I, uh, for IBM. She owns five shares of IBM stock. This ownership is immaterial to Gina. Okay, is Gina a covered member? Yes. Yep. She's in the audit team. She's a cover member. Um, direct or indirect interest? Indirect. Actually, because it's IBM stock, it's going to be direct. Yeah, so this is um, direct. And material or immaterial? So now, if it's a direct interest, though, uh, and she's a cover member, uh, and on injury, is she in violation of the uh, independence rules? Yes. Yes. Yeah. She's in violation of the independence rules because she cannot own any direct interest, even five shares. Okay, let's take Greg. Greg's a member of the audit engagement uh, for IBM. He has an investment in the S&P 500 mutual fund we just talked about. Because IBM is in the S&P 500, the mutual fund has a direct interest in IBM. Okay, Greg, uh, covered member? Yes. 
Uh, direct interest or indirect? Indirect. Yeah. Now, uh, Greg's buying into the fund, and the fund is then buying. Uh, material or immaterial? We kind of just talked about it. Immaterial? Yeah. Well, it's one of 500 companies. So there's 499 other companies in there. So, you know, if IBM has a good year or bad, it probably doesn't make too much of a difference in the fund. So, this would be um, immaterial. You know, notice the difference, you know, in about, you know, the, as far as the, uh, you, you look at how, it, how it, it, uh, it impacts the investment. If you own just IBM stock, if IBM does well or bad, it will have a big impact on your investment. But again, if you're in the S&P 500 fund, it, you know, probably doesn't have too much of a impact. Oh, so is Greg in violation? No. Nope, you're right. You're not in violation. It's in indirect. Uh, indirect interest and is immaterial. So, Professor, we just really answering the yes and no answer for the 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 uh, the poll over here, right? Yep, A, A or B. A, B, B. Okay. I don't want to see any C's in there. <laughs> I have a, a class where they, uh, there's a couple of people didn't take it too seriously. Uh, all the questions were A, B, C, D. There's a number of E answers. I was not happy. But anyway. Uh, okay. Helen is not a member of the audit engagement for IBM. However, she's the senior auditor in the engagement office. She owns 500 shares of IBM stock. This investment is material to Helen. Okay, is Helen uh, a covered member? Yes. Actually, she's not. She's not. If you, you, yeah, it kind of goes back to this thing. I'm what? sorry, I forgot already. Is she a senior? Yeah, that's why I was saying, isn't she part of the senior of the engagement office? It is, she's not in the, she's not on the office. Oh, okay. Yeah, and now she was on the audit, yeah, absolutely. But if she's not on the audit and she's a senior, you know, the only the only seniors that are covered members are gonna be the ones on the audit. So, you know, the, you know this could be her, I guess. So, so this is her. So she's not a covered member. So the question, you know, the rule doesn't apply to her. So coming back here, she's not a covered member. The interest is direct or indirect? Direct. Is direct. Yep. And it's material. It's material. Is she in violation? Yes. I'll say no. Yeah, actually, no. No? Nope. Not a guy covered member. You can own 500 wow. for even, so you can't you can still have interest in the company and not and, and, and be independent. Yes. Yeah, well, she, because she's not on the audit. Okay. She's not right. on the audit and she's not a partner. So again, these uh, you know basically we're looking at the people in green. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So if you're not in green, then you can actually have stock in the company. Yeah. And the company that you that's being audited about a firm. Okay. There's a quirky rule we get to later where you can't have more than 5% ownership of the company. If someone had 5% ownership of IBM, they would not probably be working on a CPA firm. They'd be living on an island somewhere. Um, so they, yeah, but the, uh, if, if you are not, you know, we're, we're basically looking at the green people here. So if you're not one of these green people. So if you're not covered. You're not, exactly. If you're not a covered member, the covered member rules do not apply to you. Okay. So she is not in um, violation. Okay. <clears throat> Immediate family members. 
So this kind of goes to say, okay, I know. I'll, you know, I can't when I get stock, I'll have my, I'll give the stock to my husband or my kid or, you know, well, that doesn't work either because immediate family members are considered covered members. And the next question is, well, who qualifies as an immediate family member? Yeah, spouses. Spousal equivalents. Um, I suppose we're on the same day there. Uh, and uh, dependents. And uh, usually this is dependent children. Immediate family members are, you know, the basically the people when you go home at night, who do you see? That's your family. So anyone who's usually in the house, um, you know, that's who's going to be the family. So those immediate family members are considered the same as covered members. So if anyone, you know, if, if anyone in the family is a, actually that's not true. Is it? Uh, if if any of the uh, spouses are covered members, everyone in the family is a covered member. Okay. Yeah, it'd be like, it has a, there are people who aren't, you know, your, your, your parents, for instance, are not considered covered members. I guess if they were dependent on you, they'd be like, right. but, uh, uh, but you know, for the most part, they're not considered covered members. Your brothers and sisters are not considered covered members. So immediate family. All right, now there's other rules for those. Good question, because I get a little confused there, Professor. So you're saying that a, a, a covered member, if any one of their direct family members works or what is it for the company, have interest in that company, then you're not independent, right? The, the the independent rules apply to them also. So you know, so for well, well here let's um the, the, let's go through. The, I think we go through the cases. So okay, yeah. So that that uh, um for for the purposes of being a covered member, and, and the idea it's kind of close up a loophole. So something like, oh, it's not me. It's my you know, it's my husband. It's my wife or you know, my kid. Or whatever. So you know to, to avoid that, and, and and again, this is you know you, you got to avoid. The um, in fact and in, in, in appearance, so you don't want to act kind of like, oh yeah, the auditor's kid owns stock, and, you know, whatever. Uh, so okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, so Sharon is a member of the audit engagement um, for IBM. She does not own any IBM stock, but her husband owns ten thousand shares of IBM stock. Okay, uh, covered member or not a covered member? Covered member. Yep. Immediate family, you know, this is a spouse. So remember, uh, direct interest or indirect? Direct. Direct. And material. Yep, definitely material. So, yeah, 10,000 shares is worth quite a bit. Um, <laughs> about a million dollars. <laughs> so, is it in violation of the rules? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Steve is a member of the audit engagement for IBM. He does not own any stock, but his daughter owns an immaterial amount of IBM stock. Okay, uh, covered member or not a covered member? Covered member. Yep. Uh, direct or indirect? I guess it could be indirect. Actually, it's direct. Is direct? Yep. If they own the, oh, if they own the, yeah, if they own the um, 
If they on stock, it's direct. Yep. Okay, but it's immaterial. Yeah, immaterial. Now, if it's immaterial, if, if it's a covered member and it's direct. <laughs> it's yeah. gotta be material. No, it actually, it, it, it could be, he can own even one share. So is Steven violation? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, he is in violation. He, uh, his, his daughter is considered to be a covered member, you know, related to him. And uh, it's in, in, um, How can direct interest be immaterial? He can, it could be a small amount. Is that yeah. what that's saying? Yeah, like one share of stock. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's not material. And, and uh, a reasonable person could say, well, it's just one share. Who cares? You know, I don't. But the idea is that you, you you can't have it come out that oh, the auditors had investments in this place, and that's why. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, all, all we give a company, all we give it, the only thing an audit does is give credibility to the financial statements. So okay. if if you erode that, it's worthless. You know, mm -hmm. an audit done by someone who's not independent is worthless. Mm -hmm. It's like when you read a story about something and you know. It's great. You give that somebody who is invested in it, and they say it doesn't mean much because it's uh, whatever. Okay, Joan is a member of the audit engagement team. She does not own any share in the but her husband has a large investment in technology fund. Forty percent of the technology fund holdings are in IBM stock. Okay, uh, covered member or not a covered. I would say covered member. Yeah, covered. Yep. So covered. Uh, direct or indirect? It's indirect. Uh, material or immaterial? I would say material. Forty percent is quite a bit. Yep. And if you, and, and here's how you know if you're wondering whether it's material or not, uh, think about it in terms of if IBM had a good year or a bad year, would it affect? You know, would it affect the um, fund? Yeah. <laughs> and 40 percent is quite a bit. Yeah. It, it, yeah. If you had a good year, bet you would. So, uh, yes, it's in violation. Uh, because it's indirect interest, but it's material. Now, if it was immaterial, you know, then it would be fine. You know, if it was 40 percent, if it was 4 percent or something, you know, or whatever, it, it was possible it could be. But would, she, would they still be in violation, though, if it was immaterial? No. No, no. So, for instance, uh, you know, if, if, if her husband had a lot of in technology, but if it, let's say it's at a 40%, it was 4%. A company is 4% of a, it probably wouldn't move it that much if it had a good year or a bad year. Okay. You know what I mean? So, and, and then again, you, you, the next obvious question is, well, what percentage is it? Well, it, it probably depends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, a lot of these are judgment calls. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have. Oh, yeah, I'll see what we have. I'll see what Okay, well, we'll do page four, then we'll call it nine. Okay, close friends, close friends and relatives. Friends, you probably don't need the definition of what those are. Well, actually, actually there, there, there's a little bit they got to talk about. Those. So close friends and relatives, who are they talking about? The relatives. Uh, they are your parents. Non-dependent children. Uh, siblings. Your brothers and sisters. Those are usually the people that are included in close relatives and friends. Now, friends can be a little bit tricky, um, and, and and actually, close relatives can be. For instance, if I have a if I have a second cousin, is that second cousin a close relative? No. Yeah, but probably not. But there could be a circumstance. Maybe you know, maybe it's my second cousin. Maybe I raised, you know, that 
the child is my own, you know, and the, 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 they were in our house you know, for 18 years. Or, you know, it, it, it is possible that there are other things. And, and it's kind of impossible to look at all the scenarios. On it. But um, uh, yeah, so generally speaking, there's, you know, as parents, independent children, children that moved out, and uh, siblings, brothers and sisters. So these are close relatives and friends. These are not covered members. So would your best best friend be? <laughs> nope, not a covered member. Not a covered member, okay. Unless your best friend just calls. But, uh, Why do they use friends? Why they just don't say relatives? Yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, so these are uh, not covered members. Um, but they do have some rules. Okay, so close relatives and friends, um, these are usually ones they show. Uh, there is a problem with friends sometimes because it, um, well, a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, let's go in there. And this can sometimes be a problem of, you know, how do you define what your uh, friends are? <laughs> uh, but uh, also a lot of times in companies, uh, they will, a lot of audits come from relationships with people. So, you know, the, some of the higher ups in the company may be very, may be considered friends of the auditor. Um, that's not that uncommon. Uh, so there is kind of this thing that there's also professional relationships that while they could be uh, um, deemed as friends, they usually fall outside of this. So, you know, it's just it is part of the partners are basically really high end salespeople. It's how much business they can get in. So there are a lot of people that consider them, would consider them friends. Um, and, but those professional relationships are usually different than, say, my best friend from high school. Okay, now, so here are the rules. So, uh, closer than friends. Uh, may own direct interest. Yep, it is immaterial. Now there's a second even, the second kind of crazy rule. So let's call this a, and here's the crazy rule. They own a direct uh, interest if it is material and unknown So they can always own a direct interest if it's immaterial. And by the way, uh, we talk about immaterial, it's immaterial to the close relative or friend.
So immateriality is considered is by the terms of the clothes relative. So is it material to the relative? That's what we're talking about. Okay, it can be a direct interest and material if it is unknown to the covered member. And if you think about it, if they don't know about it, it, it can't influence them. But you know, so here's the thing that's different about immediate family members. Uh, when it comes to relatives, siblings, and I, you know, there are people you know, that haven't talked to their father in 30 years. Their father might own a direct material interest in IBM. Haven't talked to him in 30 years, no plans on talking to him in 30 years. <laughs> You can go 30 more. Um, so if it's unknown, the auditors are now, again, the problem comes with that is how do you prove that it's unknown? Uh, proving the negative is impossible, but basically. So you can't say, okay, here's a picture that shows me not knowing that, you know. Um, so, but if it's unknown, then it is, um, it's allowed. And it, 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 if you think about it, it's, uh, it's unknown. They, they don't know about it, so it can't influence them if, if it truly is unknown. Okay, so let's take the cases here. Wanda, the member of the audit engagement for IBM. She's not only any shares of IBM stock, but knows that her sister owns 500 shares. The IBM stock is immaterial to her sister. Okay, is her sister a covered member? No. Nope. These are not covered members, the close relatives. Only the immediate family are the covered members. Um, these are not covered members. Uh, direct or indirect interest? Direct. Direct. And, and immaterial. Immaterial. Uh, is she in violation? No. Nope. The material. So they can always have a direct interest in the material. Okay. Stacy is a member. There's a lot of people on the uh, engagement team. Oh, when 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 uh, Wanda be a cover member? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, up here, uh, Wanda. If Wanda owned the stock. One is a covered member, but her um, parents, not dependent children, siblings, these are not covered members, uh, but there's still rules that, that uh, impact them. So if they are a parent, not dependent uh, children, or si uh, siblings of a covered member, there's still rules that relate to them. And by the way, these are somewhat con controversial, and I'll tell you why in a little bit here. But yeah, so. Wanda's a covered member, absolutely. If she owned the sack in violation. But this is her sister. Her sister is not considered a covered member. Only her immediate family, spouses, spousal equivalents, then and children are considered covered members. So um her sister. Yeah, so it, and, and that was that makes this a, a little bit strange that you know it, it, this is being related to a covered member. There are some rules. Okay, uh, Stacy is a member of the um, She does not own any shares, but her knows that her brother owns 300 shares. Yeah, the stock is material to her brother. Okay, so um, not covered. Not covered. And is direct. Yep. And material. In violation? Yes, because she knows. Yep. Exactly, because she knows it. If she didn't know about it, she would not be in violation. And notice that, you know, 500 shares wasn't material. It really depends on their financial, you know, how they're doing financially, as to whether it's material or not. So you can't just say, oh, it's 100 shares or whatever. It depends on the person. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, Aces? So the green that we're highlighting, uh, it's not 
It's not specifically the the member of the engagement. It's the person that owns the stock. Yeah, it's whether the person that owns the stock is a current member. Now, it relates to the person who's on the audit as far as them not being independent. So Stacy, you know, they they're not gonna pull her her brother or something like that. They're not gonna pull her brother out. Her brother's not on the audit. But uh, Stacy would have would be taken off the audit because her brother owns a direct material interest in IBM. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is kind of strange. I mean, that it's it, it relates to the covered member, but the people are not actually considered uh, covered members. They have close relatives and uh, friends. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, Lawrence is a member of the engagement team. He is not only shares, but his father has a material investment in IBM stock. Lawrence does not know about his father's IBM investment. Okay, his father is not a covered member. And. Um, is there Ray? Yep. And it's material. And it's material. And is he in um, violation? He's not. Good. Yep. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, doesn't know about it. So, you know, so here you have two, you know. Not a cover member, direct interest material, direct interest material. These look the same, except one is, is known. And one, one is known, and this one is does not know. So if, if you don't know about it, it can't influence them. That's basically the idea behind it. And again, you know, may not, may not even know where it's found in the world, but you know, you know the situation of it. Okay, May is a member of the audit engagement team. Does not want to share realize that, but her mother has a material investment in IBM stock. May knows about this investment and asks her mother to sell it. Okay, so May knows that there is this material amount of IBM stock. She knows about it. She says, ask her mom to sell it so that she can do the audit. And her mom refuses. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> Go back into the basement. Here. So, um, uh so uh is the mother a uh, cover member no uh direct interest yeah right yeah and material yep material and yes the violation and this uh i can tell you that there have been uh law cases about this one. <laughs> because uh, it, it's, it's possible you have somebody who is prohibited from making a livelihood by because of things that, I, that are not under her control. I, I, I don't know the outcome of them. I, I'd be lying if I did. I said it, but I know that there have been cases where people have sued, saying, "Look, I should be able to work on the audit. I have no control over what my mom does, and she's not going to, you know, she's not going to sell the stock, you know, because of somebody else's." Whatever you know, I can't do this audit. So, um, like I say, I'm not sure how those how those work out. But there is, a, there are laws on making a livelihood that people will have the right to make a livelihood, and this is where, that's where this comes in violation of that. You know, or even up here, you know that you know Stacy has her, her brother. Her brother owns a stock material. You know, so what you, you, you hopefully they would sell it <laughs> but um yeah uh if they don't um yeah you, you can be in violation a covered member uh, because of a close friend or relative or i said that wrong close relative or friend <laughs> okay so um are we all in so make sure you get your or is it i'll tell you, I'll give you guys extra credit points for not turning this in. On the, on the test. But uh, so get your answers in, and I'll close the polling a little bit here. So we'll stop right here.
and we'll start this next week. And I will get a test out to you guys uh, by tomorrow. <laughs> next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. Next week I will. Okay. Let me save that. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to try to make these more and more of these polls. I like these polls. Um, uh, and, and again, you're, you're, these are not anonymous, so your names will be on there. And okay. It looks like everybody's in, so I'll end the polling. Uh, I'm going to share the results. Um, it it should they shouldn't have your name on there because I don't have you registered to the class, but uh, take a look and see if are the names on it or not. No. Okay. Good. No. Okay. All right. Well, I will download it. Okay. Stop sharing the results. Oh. Uh, okay. All right. So I will see you guys uh, next week, and I will send out a uh, test for the chapter five stuff. And again, it's going to be a little bit more uh, definition y. Uh, like I said, I'll put a couple of cases on it, a couple, a couple of extra credit things on it. But if you have any questions, you're, you're, feel free to contact me and uh, we'll go over stuff. But um, anyway, I will have that out. Uh, by, I might do it tonight. I might get done by tonight, but um, more likely tomorrow. Uh, any questions? Yes. Professor, I had sent you a message earlier. I'm not sure if you got it or had time to respond. Concerning um, the exam, like I said, I saw it today. <laughs> Oh, you submitted it today? Yeah, I found, well, I, I saw it today, so I didn't get a chance to do the exam part. I did the sampling and turned it in. Okay. The sampling exam, yeah. Uh, you have questions on it? No, uh, I don't think I have questions. It's just that I just did that today, the sampling and practice exam. And so I just wanted to take like a day to look over it because I didn't even see the ex actual exam out there until today. Oh yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, definitely. You, you can okay. You, you can take time to. to uh, I get it done by tomorrow. Oh, absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Um, okay. And 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 that goes for everybody. And and you bring up a good point too, though, in that um, if you are missing any work, then I'm not talking about the the stuff of the sampling and anything. Uh, turn it in. I don't take that. You won't be penalized. I don't take off okay. the So if you're missing anything, this is for everybody. If you're missing anything, turn there's no reason, there's no reason not to turn it in. And there's all of the Zoom meetings are recorded. So if you're missing something, you can kind of get, you know, whether it be the recorded Zoom meeting um, and you know, fill out the fill out the whatever the, the handout or do it on notebook paper or however you do it and turn it in and uh, you'll get credit for it. So and 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 uh, also another I know I keep adding stuff on here. And not to get too preachy about this, but we're on week 14. So we have two more weeks after this. Week 16 is usually very, um, very expensive time. Uh, you know, I have like uh, the, the group projects and all kinds of stuff. Like my point being, if you are missing anything, this would be the ideal time to turn it in so that you can be uh, freed up for week 16 for the, the classes that have big papers and uh, group projects and all that kind of stuff. Right. So anyway, uh, yeah, so everything has to be turned in by the end of the semester, obviously. And uh, uh, okay. yeah, I strongly encourage you to turn it in if you're missing anything. Okay, just a quick question. So mm -hmm. um, after the exam is in, the next one is gonna be on chapter five, and then this modular stuff kind of will be on there on the next test. So the last thing we'll do is the module. In chapter five. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So chapter five I'll be sending it out tomorrow. Oh, you send that out tomorrow. Right. Well, we have a final though too. Well, the module B will be the last one, and we should, we should finish up module B next class, and that okay. will give us. Um, I, I like to have that last class to be kind of a cleanup class for people that 
have questions or, or you know uh, do a, you know other things that turn it in all that kind of stuff. So, so anyway, maybe like two more exams. That's what I'm trying to see. We got two. Yes, chapter five and the module B. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Good night. Okay. Good night, Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye, guys.